breaking the wall of data deluge. How efficient data exploration enables new scientific discoveries. Anastasia Alamaki, École Polytechnique Fédérale de Lausanne. The wall falling made me realize that every dream is possible, and it is. Hello, welcome, and thank you very much for this opportunity to be normal. Um, I'm a computer scientist, and I work on data management within computer science, but I'm a firm believer in interdisciplinary science. And today I'd like to introduce to you the part of technology that I think can make a huge impact on the world of tomorrow, and of course, today. So uh, let's talk about technology, shall we? No, we toast bread, we like that. In 1800, we would have this device to toast, to toast bread. Through the years, it took us about 200 years, in fact, to come up to other models, to the most sophisticated models. Well, that's about as sophisticated as it's gonna get, right? So this scientific progress is modest relatively to other fields, for example, car industry, right? It took only 120 years to go from a model that runs 13 kilometers an hour all the way to a model that runs 250 kilometers an hour, a factor of 20 in 120 years. That's much more impressive than the toaster industry, but there's absolutely no industry, no technology that progresses faster than the computer technology. In 1946, the first computer, his name, its name was ENIAC, uh, took about the size of uh, a six bedroom apartment and uh, could compute at the rate of 100 kilohertz and uh, weighed about 27 tons. And that's how computation started to be done electronically. The evolution of transistors and our integration trends, which allow us to pack more and more transistors in the same chip area every 18 months, we double how many transistors we pack in the same chip area, in fact, led us to different computers. And the last one I'm showing is up there. It's a phone, it's a telephone, um, a smartphone, in fact, which runs at about two gigahertz, takes a few square centimeters worth of space, and can do, in the same time as ENIAC, can do about a million more computations. So, and that's the smallest computer you can buy today. So that's really amazing. That's the fastest growing technology. But there's one trend that comes from this fastest growing technology and grows even faster than that technology, and that's the data the data that we collect in the world. We collect data when we go to the supermarket, we collect data when we go to the doctor, we collect data when we click on the internet. There's data collected right now, someone's filming me, that's going to be data in a computer, okay? And that trend of collection, of data collection, the red line, grows much faster than the blue line, which is our ability to process that data despite the technological trend that I showed before, the impressive growth of, of, of computer technology. So we need to bridge that gap. And the sciences, scientific data, are an amazing reason why we need to bridge that gap. I'm going to relate to the previous speaker now um, and make the same case, but for a different reason. The sequencing of the human DNA uh, was a big breakthrough, but it was an expensive exercise. In 2000, it cost about $10,000. Uh, now, that trend went down to $1. So in only 10 years, we had four orders of magnitude of cost drop. This means that all of a sudden, we can sequence everything. We can take a little water, do gene sequencing there, we can take a little water from, from, from 10 meters away, follow evolution of, of bacteria, follow trends, follow anything through the data, because it's so cheap. Technology makes that possible. And there is a lot of data being gathered. These are just two of the databases, the trace database that has, about, that has raw data of about two trillion pairs. And then there's also the sequence read archive that has next generation data raw data of about uh, 25 trillion bear pairs. So these are the actual lines. They're not even plottable in comparison to the, to the cost drop. 
There is one trend, however, that doesn't follow those, and it is how we process that data. What do we do with that data? As an example, take the whole, uh, the, the whole human genome shotgun um, sequence, the trend of which is much more modest than the data collection trend. So what we want to do is to bridge that gap. As a computer scientist, I'm proud that we're able to give the world the technology to gather all of this data. But I'm not very happy that we can't yet have the technology to process all this data for the benefit of the human. So as a database person, as a data management person, I feel responsible and my work is in trying to bridge that gap through efficient data management to be able to harness all this data and turn it into useful information. So I'm going to give you just a couple of examples of my work so far in this area. We're going to switch gears for a little bit here and go to astronomy. For, from the beginning of time, people wondered what's out there. And today, because of technology, we have elaborate telescopes that give us a lot of information about celestial objects. This is an example of a future telescope that's called the Large Synoptic Array Telescope that's going to record data from the sky at about 20 petabytes and, uh, every night. Um, that petabytes is a very large amount of data. I'm not going to bore you with, with details here. Well, that's what we do, right? I mean, as computer science, we gather data and then we scare people with it. But um, so the data looks like this. This is really what the data looks like, OK? There's types of data recorded and when they were uh, being photographed and what is the information about it that's interesting. And you have the astronomers that are wondering about what's happening in the sky. So the astronomer wants to go look at that data and say, tell me which galaxies are fast moving. And he can do that, you know, if the data is a modest size, he can just go look at every single line of that data, find which are the galaxies, and then figure out when it, they were observed, match them together, and do the processing necessary. But as the data grows, this is not scalable. They can't do it as efficiently. You can still do it. You can go through a lot of data, but that's going to take a lot of time. So what we want is to find methods. My work is to find methods, such as, for example, come up with structures that can be applied on that data, such as the indexing structure, which is like an index finger, and can show the astronomer where the galaxies are without him having to go through all the data to discover them. There's two nice things about it. The first one is that you go directly to the data that you care about. The second one is that the methods that we discover to do that are not directly dependent and do not take as long commensurately to how much data you have. So they're not dependent. The performance is not dependent on the amount of data. So we disassociate ourselves from the very impressive trend of, of, of data growth. And we're able to, to come up with, inter with, with really performant methods for going through large amounts of data. Now, that's a very simple example that allows us to do things um, fast. Going back to, to medicine, uh, we started a, a, a proposal for a project recently uh, headed by EPFL. And uh, uh, it, this project encompasses about 165 PIs, and it's called the Human Brain Project. And it's about simulating the human brain, being able to harness the data, starting from the molecules all the way up to, to, to the brain and cognition, going through neurons and synapse, synapses and, and uh, uh, micro and meso and macro circuits, um, all the way up to, to the whole picture of the brain, and then being able to harness all of that data uh, and, and understand how the brain works. And this is, by and large, a data integration problem. We need to be able to integrate data and knowledge through patterns and rules and through models that we have to understand how the brain works. As a very simple example, imagine a neuroscientist looking at this picture, seeing something interesting, and wanting to drag his or her mouse in the area around the area that they're interested in and go directly in there and get more information, go deeply in there and get more information. That's not even possible if you have to go through the entire set of data to figure out where is this area and get the data that's needed to show the neuroscientist. If I take too long to do that, the neuroscientist is just going to lose context, won't even remember why they asked for that piece of data. I have to do this instantaneously. That's very important. 
That's why efficient data management is key here. So bridging is the key. Communication is the key. Communication between computer science and all the other domain sciences. The brain scientist has to tell me what they need in order for me to be able to provide the appropriate methods for them to find it. So the astronomer, the same thing. So interdisciplinary research is a very important thing, but also in order to bridge the gap between data connection and data processing. And I'm going to end with the duality of my science, which is essentially its service nature to other sciences, and at the same time, it's introspective nature to cope with the growth of the, growth of the underlying technology. Okay? Building algorithms to do work is a difficult thing. You have to build a sequence of steps and describe what you need to do and then find, get to the target. Consider cooking, for example. Oops. Consider cooking, for example. Okay? Cooking is a tedious process for many. It's an enjoyable process for a lot of people. A chef who wants to cook a seven-course meal has a time frame. Now, this seven-course meal requires 10 hours to do. The chef says, I need 10 hours. The director, the, 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 the restaurant owner says, that's not good enough. I need it in 15 minutes. And I'm going to give you 40 sous chefs who are going to do it for you in, in, uh, um, in, in due time because 10 hours by 40 gives us 15 minutes. So just divide the work to them. Isn't that simple? Well, that's not really very simple, right? And the reason why it's not simple is that you can't really divide the work just like that. The flavors don't mix if you just don't mix correctly if you just divide the ingredients around. But there's another, even more subtle problem. Say that you're so smart as a chef, you divided the work correctly. <laughs> what if there is only one salt shaker? Putting salt on the dish is a process that takes a split second, but putting salt when 40 people are waiting to put salt basically makes 39 people wait. So all this parallelism doesn't work, right? So use of critical resources is very important to be done correctly. And that's a very difficult problem because a human brain is used to work through a sequence of steps. And I'm going to back up here because the slides were. This is what a computer looks like today. Okay? It's a highly parallel machine, and, and, and that's why we need to get past that hurdle. So, finally, data driven science is what we have today. We're bridging computer science with all domain sciences to harness data into useful information. Thank you.